Hi. Uh, I apologize if I, uh, at times in my talk, pause a little bit. You're catching me right at my power nap time. <laughs> so I'm a little foggy headed, but I'll do the best I can here. Uh, so I feel like a little bit of the odd man out at this workshop because I really won't actually say all that much about uh, entropy or information in my talk. I, I'm mainly going to talk about neutral theory in the ecological context. So this neutral theory of biodiversity maintenance and niche theory. Uh, and I'll be presenting a view that neutral theory uh, has a potential to play this role as a more process-based null model in community ecology for uh, wh whose failures can give us evidence of the influence of niches or habitat filtering on communities, similar to the role of neutral theory in the evolutionary biology context as a null model for detecting selection. Uh, so that'll really mainly be my focus, but uh, my interest in being part of this workshop arises out of an interest in really the common ground between neutral theory and uh, en more uh, entropy-based approaches. Um, and really the common ground, not just between neutral theory, but more broadly thinking about stochastic population dynamics and uh, how uh, that relates to thinking about entropy. So um, my own experience with entropy mainly comes from taking courses in statistical physics. Uh, I studied physics before switching into ecology. And there, at least what I think I learned, I don't, I don't remember it all that well, I'm still kind of uh, trying to remember, uh, is uh, basically about the power of uh, thinking about systems from an ergodic perspective. So that's something that hasn't been brought up today, but that's sort of the way I uh, come at it uh, in thinking about it from physics. And also in uh, thinking about a system that's potentially quite complicated from a simpler perspective. And then uh, the uh, predictive insights into macroscopic phenomena that can arise out of taking those, those approaches. Um, so I'm excited about the possibility of gaining that sort of power by taking those kinds of approaches to stochastic population dynamics. Um, and so uh, that's the interest uh, here. So uh, perhaps I shouldn't have uh, totally gone along with the title that, that John uh, gave for me. I less so think about neutral theory as a competitor to maximum entropy, more what brings me here is my interest in the overlap between the two. Uh, but uh, it does make some uh, predictions. So it's from some senses, you could think of it as a competitor. Uh, so my talk's mainly going to be focused on talking about neutral theory and niche theory. And uh, just at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some work I've encountered that does make some linkages between <coughs> neutral theory and uh, entropy theory. So uh, kind of the driving question uh, in thinking about neutral theory is a question of biodiversity maintenance. Uh, persistent challenge in ecology is understand the maintenance of biodiversity. Uh, in particular, it's a challenge to understand this maintenance in the fa face of the potentially strong influence that competition can have on communities. Uh, so naively, one expects that among a set of competing species, uh, competing for the same resources, the dominant competitor should just exclude all of the others. And yet in nature, we observe many competing species coexisting, and their diversity can be surprisingly high. So for example, on Barrow, Colorado Island, which is shown in this picture and is an island that was formed when the Panama Canal was built, there are hundreds of tree species in an area the size of about 50 football fields just among the large individuals. And uh, that's probably not even really that representative of the diversity in the region because essentially BCI is what was a hilltop before, so it's kind of homogeneous. And uh, uh, other tropical forests can be even more diverse. So over time, ecological theory has given us some insight into how uh, this kind of diversity might arise. So moved us beyond this perspective, naive perspective of the dominant competitor just winning. We know that if there are multiple limiting resources, as many species as resources can stably coexist. We know that having specialist enemies can enable coexistence. We know that having life history trade-offs, uh, like having uh, one, some species be better colonizers and others better competitors can also allow for coexistence. So, yeah, go ahead. For discrete resources and s to have stable coexistence, that's the lim upper bound. Yeah. Uh, that's what's uh, predicted in population dynamic theory. Uh, so, um, so anyway, the, these various explanations uh, could help us explain the diversity on, in some place like BCI. But showing that those explanations actually do uh, explain the stable coexistence of all these species is actually uh, quite a challenge. Uh, so it's difficult to show, even though we have these ideas about how it might work. 
And I think if this is an important challenge in ecology, we can't really claim to be able to project the responses and feedbacks of ecosystems to global changes if we can't understand how the species within them are coexisting. So uh, at this most basic level, uh, a question, the question of biodiversity maintenance and community ecology has been uh, focused around the question of is it niche or neutral in nature, where niche theory proposes that it's species differences that allow the coexistence of competitors. And in this case, the coexistence is stable. And what I mean by that here specifically is that species can invade one another from low abundance. So the population dynamics might be more complicated than having a stable equilibrium point, but there's a restoring force in the system so that when one species gets to very low abundance, there's something that tends to bring it uh, back into the system. In this case, the species richness is determined by the number of niches. So for example, the number of resources available for the species uh, and uh, species relative abundances are determined by the relative prevalence of their niches, so the relative availability of the resources that they consume. The alternative to this idea that's been uh, especially put forward by Steve Hubble, who's a tropical forest biologist that worked on Barrow, Colorado Island, is that coexistence of competitors is instead due to species similarities. And in this case, the uh, dynamics are not stable. Instead, they're actually dominated by stochasticity. And species richness is determined by a balance between colonization at small scales or speciation at large scales with extinction at those scales. And species relative abundances are shaped by demographic stochasticity and dispersal limitations, so how much immigration there is from another location. So uh, niche theory is kind of, uh, the way I think of it is really a body of ideas about how species might coexist, so a lot of models that people have proposed about it, whereas neutral theory is actually a quantitative theory of what the structure of communities would look like under this assumption of species coexisting through their similarities. And because of that, it has the potential to play an important role uh, as a, a quantitative tool for enabling us to get insight into process from the patterns of community structure. So uh, I'm going to uh, continue to just give you some more background about um, these two ideas in ecology and then tell you uh, more about the idea of neutral theory as playing a role as a null model and to what degree we've had success with, with doing that in ecology. So first a little bit more about the idea behind niche theory, this idea of coexistence through species differences. Uh, we can think about this in the context of the Locke of Volterra competition model, uh, which is a model of the population growth rates of two species interacting. And uh, in it, the, uh, sorry, basically just follows a logistic population growth model with an extra term reflecting the negative effect on the per capita growth rate from uh, the presence of the other species. Uh, and when uh, the carrying capacities are equal in this model, uh, these alpha coefficients uh, just tell you about the strength with which species impact each other's population growth rates compared to their influence on themselves. And also helpful for interpreting these coefficients is you could derive this model from a model involving uh, consumer resource dynamics by assuming that the dynamics of the resource are fast. And if you do that, then the alpha just reflects how much the species overlap in their consumption of the resources. So alpha equals one would mean they, they completely overlap, and alpha less than one would mean there are some uh, uh, differences between them and their resource consumption. So to, so to get stable coexistence in this uh, model, uh, in the case of equal carrying capacities at least, uh, we have to have these alpha coefficients be less than one. And uh, this is often what's shown in textbooks, the diagram on the left there. Is there a pointer here? Let's see. That's it, and it's this thing on the side? No. Oh, I see it. OK. Uh, is, uh, so this is just kind of the phase space, the, the population size of the two species. And what's shown are these zero growth isoclines of the species. And there's an equilibrium point where they overlap, where both population growth rates are zero, and uh, in this condition, when the carrying capacities are the same and the alphas are less than one, you have a stable equilibrium point. Okay, so niche theory's idea that competing species coexist stably like this, they might not boil down to actually having a stable equilibrium point. Uh, for more uh, complicated scenarios, the dynamics could be more complicated, but at least that any points involving just one species persisting on its own uh, tend to be unstable, uh, that you tend to get invasion from low abundance. So niche theory is the idea of species coexisting in that way by differing in some way in their, in their consumption of resources. 
Now, among just two species, any differences uh, in resource consumption will do as long as the alphas are less than one uh, and the carrying capacities are constant, there'll be stable coexistence of two species. But things actually change when you add a third species and we're led to the insight that for more than two species to stably coexist, the differences between the species and the resource consumption actually has to be large enough. There's some limit to how similar the species can be. So MacArthur and Levins derived this principle limiting similarity in 1967 from a model of competition among species on a niche axis. So essentially they envision species uh, having some niche value that indicates the center of its resource utilization. So they imagined a resource axis going along with this and these uh, U values of the species uh, corresponding to uh, just the centers of their resource use on this resource axis. And so you could think of the, about this, for example, as uh, seeds of a continuum of sizes on the resource axis and the U reflecting what seed size it, the species focuses on. So uh, you can again think about a consumer resource model of this kind of dynamics and take the limit of fast resource dynamics and you'll get a lock of Volterra competition model where the alphas will depend on the uh, uh, distance between species in this, on this niche axis. So There'll be a decreasing function so that species that are farther away compete less strongly. And uh, MacArthur and Levins, what they showed using this model is that if you have two resonant species like this on the axis, then in order for a third one to be able to invade in between, there has to be enough distance between them on the niche axis. And in particular, if the resource utilization is Gaussian, the distance between the resource utilization curves has to be about equal to the width of the Gaussian. Okay, so niche theory involves this idea of species uh, actually differences having to be large enough once you have more than two species. One other thing I want to say about niche theory is uh, what I mean by the term niche, because sometimes people get confused what, by what's uh, meant by that. And I actually I mean something a little different than these early definitions of uh, the early definition of niche provided by Grinnell, this idea of it being a set of conditions allowing the persistence of a population. And in particular, if people have heard of niche modeling of species distributions, they might often think of it just being the set of abiotic conditions on a landscape under which a species can persist. So here I have a definition in mind that's a little bit more specific to competition theory, and uh, it's a definition focused on what enables stable and robust coexistence of competitors, which is differences in interaction with regulating factors, where what regulating factors are are factors that influence and are influenced by population sizes. So things like a classical resource, the level of resource is influenced by the population and how much resource is available also influences the population growth rate of the population. So there's this uh, uh, influence in both directions. Now we can also think about uh, these kinds of differences, differences in the set of abiotic conditions uh, being niche differences. And in that case, the regulating factor is the availability of habitat on the landscape with the requirements that the species, uh, the, the required conditions for the species. We could also think of regulating factors as enemies. Uh, so uh, the population sizes of the enemies. And we use this different definition of niche differences because uh, competition theory uh, basically, that this is something I've been involved in is using kind of a general model independent mathematical framework to show that this is in fact, in general, what it enable uh, stable and robust uh, coexistence. So the robust part is, is the idea that the coexistence would also persist under uh, variation in the environment. So it's not just dynamically stable, but if you vary the parameters of the model, that it would also persist. Okay, so let's think about uh, neutral theory in contrast to this. This is the idea of coexistence through similarity. So in the context of the lock of Volterra competition model, this just corresponds to the, <coughs> the alphas being equal to one when the carrying capacities are equal. So that's the simplest way to think about it. Uh, so really it just involves complete interchangeability of uh, individuals of different species. They influence each other at the same way they influence themselves and they're completely overlapping in their uh, resource use or interaction with regulating factors, uh, putting it that way. So in this case, what happens to these zero growth isoclines is that they just completely overlap and you have equilibrium points all along. And when you're off of the zero growth isoclines, there's a tendency to go back that reflects a community level carrying capacity. But once you're on the line, there's no uh, tendency to move back towards where you were before. So it's just stochasticity that governs species relative abundances. <coughs> 
OK, so I'll just give you a feel for the dynamics in a neutral model, which probably a lot of you are uh, familiar with. But l let me just make sure everybody's on the same page. So the uh, model that's most often used is a spatially implicit model, where you have uh, dispersal limitation modeled by having a local community that's in contact with a meta community through some immigration rate. And um, the dynamics in the local community involve death and replacement events. And in each event, the idea is that a randomly chosen individual dies. And then uh, there's two options as to how it could get filled in. One is that it could be an immigrant from uh, basically a, an offspring of a random individual from the regional community uh, with probably n, the immigration rate. Or with probably 1 minus m, it can be an offspring of a random individual in the local community. So thinking about these dynamics maybe in the context of a forest and what Steve Hubble might have been envisioning, uh, death in a forest occurs most often during hurricanes. And when an individual dies, available space opens up that's quickly colonized. So basically, Hubble was envisioning that a death events are fairly random and that what colonizes the spot has more to do with what happens to disperse there than which species it is. So note that this model assumes that all individuals are demographically equivalent doesn't say anything about birth and death rates varying across different species. And uh, it also uh, is, uh, assumes individuals are demographically equivalent even within species. So that's one uh, sense in which it assumes uh, really more than just the absence of niches or differences between species. It ignores things like size structure. Uh, so there's some complexity that you could imagine that might matter uh, that doesn't necessarily have to do with niches uh, that the model ignores. So uh, there's, uh, this local community is connected with a meta community that has similar dynamics, uh, death and replacement events. But here, instead of immigration, there's speciation. Uh, so when the uh, vacant site is filled in, it's filled in with an entirely new individual with a probability new where new is a speciation rate, or again, uh, with an offspring from the surrounding community. So this is a simple model of speciation where species start out entirely rare. And uh, so people have explored more complicated speciation mechanisms in the context of neutral theory and found uh, they argue that it doesn't affect the, its ability to fit data well. Uh, so it might change the parameters that uh, provide the best fit to some degree. But uh, it doesn't fit its ability to change its ability to fit the data. So uh, in this model, the local community predictions depend on two parameters, theta, which involves a product of the meta community size and the speciation rate, and the immigration rate. And, uh, the uh, difficulty is that these parameters can be difficult to measure. So it's not that easy to measure dispersal or speciation rates or really figure out what size the metacommunities should be. It should be uh, basically encompassing most of the dispersal uh, from the surrounding region. So uh, that means that testing the theory uh, can boil down to uh, an exercise in curve fitting to some degree uh, because these parameters have often been left free when people test the model. So uh, let me give you a little bit of a feel for how uh, we actually predict something like a species abundance distribution from these dynamics. Um, and I'm doing this in part because uh, some of the presentations I see of the master's equations in papers are they're really different than the way I would uh, write it down. I think they, sometimes they don't make that much sense. So uh, first, let's think of this object that's the probability that a species has abundance n at time t after arising from speciation. So this isn't the same thing as a species abundance distribution. It's just imagining. Uh, following a species through time after it arises through speciation, and what's the probability it has abundance n at time t? And we know that the equilibrium distribution of this is just uh, that uh, the probability will be 1 that the species abundance is 0. Eventually, it's going to go extinct. That's the absorbing state, as long as there's uh, some speciation keeping it from fixing. Um, but we can still write down a master equation for this, and that'll be useful for actually deriving the master equation for the species abundance distribution. So this is just kind of a standard form of a master equation, thinking about uh, the rate of change in the, uh, this distribution in terms of uh, uh, transitions from states involving one fewer and one larger individual. Uh, for example, in the uh, zero-sum case where you actually imagine that the community size is fixed and you have death uh, followed by replacement, uh, the transition rate for going from uh, n individuals to n plus 1 individuals involves uh, having that species with n individuals not be chosen for the death event. So jm minus n over jm, that reflects that probability where jm is the meta community size. And then uh, there should have been not been a speciation event uh, 
and the species has to be chosen to uh, replace the dying individual. Uh, in a non-interactive formulation of neutral theory where we don't uh, keep the community size fixed, you can just imagine this being a birth rate uh, times the number of individuals. So then to think about the species abundance distribution, uh, so we define S of nt, it's the expected number of species in the community with n individuals at time t. And we can think of that as an integral over this distribution p. Uh, so we just think about integrating over all the times at which speciation uh, could have occurred and uh, by the rate at which the, uh, multiply by the rate at which speciation is occurring. Uh, now there would also be additional terms here reflecting species that were around at time t equals zero uh, that happen to have abundance n by now, but as long as you consider large times, essentially this, these terms, extra terms would go to zero. So uh, we'll think about this at large times t, where basically this is a, just a good approximation for s of nt. So uh, then by integrating over both sides of the master equation for P of n, we can show uh, what the master equation for S of n would be, and it's very similar except that it has this extra term when n equals 1 reflecting the speciation, so this uh, production of species. And uh, the solution, the equilibrium solution, is easy to get, uh, and uh, for the non-interactive case, it ends up being the log series specifically. Uh, this is also what it ends up being in the zero-sum case if you take the infinite of uh, the, the limit of infinite community size. So there are other kinds of predictions you can get from neutral theory as well. Uh, if you make it a more spatially explicit model, people have also derived things like how uh, uh, what's the probability that two uh, individuals drawn at some distance are of the same species. Uh, to give you a sense of how quickly diversity, uh, the composition of the community changes over. And there's a variety of other kinds of predictions people have looked at, but this gives you a feel for uh, what could be predicted. Uh, so uh, when Steve Hubble put forth neutral theory, which he did maybe in sort of a bold way, it actually upset many ecologists in part because people have spent their whole lives studying species differences and basically found that species clearly differ uh, and even in ways that they think could uh, enable stable coexistence. Um, and so if you take that perspective, you might wonder why we're even bothering with neutral theory. Uh, but what the proposal of neutral theory highlighted, I think, is that although it's clear that species differ in these relevant ways, what's less clear is how strong of a role do those differences play in maintaining diversity? Are there enough niches for all species? How strongly stabilized is the coexistence? Uh, so, for example, on BCI, Steve Hubble argues that this classical explanation for coexistence of tree species involving a trade-off uh, from gap specialist to shade-tolerant species, that he just sees three broad groupings of species on that trade-off axis and not really uh, evidence that it would, there's enough differences to enable the coexistence of all the species. And that kind of argument is actually surprisingly difficult to uh, find hard, hard evidence against. Another question that neutral theory highlights is how strong of a role do uh, species differences play in shaping species relative abundance and other patterns of community structure. So often what we do in ecology is to just go out and look for species differences, but not actually manage to explain how they uh, shape the relative abundance of species. So the proposal of neutral theory has, has uh, stimulated a lot of work in these directions, and there have been some advances along these lines, but I'd say these are still um, challenges. And one of the reasons why, in particular, uh, these things are challenges are, uh, one, that it's hard to carry out the manipulative experiments you need to in a system like a forest. Uh, so the places where there have been advances towards these questions have been more in annual plant systems. And uh, the other is that uh, community ecology sort of lacks in some of the quantitative tools necessary to, to gain insight into process from patterns. So we've had these null model approaches that involve randomization of data, but it's easy to argue that uh, the null model isn't re really reflecting what you'd expect to happen in the absence of niche differentiation. Uh, so that's really where neutral theory uh, comes in as uh, having the potential to serve as this null model in ecology. So it might not actually be true, but uh, it makes these predictions about patterns in community structure and the departures from those might be able to tell us about uh, when niches and habitat filtering are playing a role. And uh, I don't think all community ecologists agree that neutral theory uh, will eventually be useful in this way. A lot of times people just focus on its heuristic value for giving us insight into uh, how stochasticity can influence community structure. But I'm inspired by the successes of using neutral theory in evolutionary biology context that maybe we can do the same thing 
uh, in ecology. Uh, but so far, tests of neutral theory haven't really managed to live up to this in terms of really uh, definitively saying that niches and habitat filtering are playing a role in certain circumstances. Um, I'm not going to give a lot of the detail about how neutral theory has been tested. Um, mainly, I'll kind of sum up what the problems are with existing tests of neutral theory. And basically, it's that when neutral theory is succeeded, succeeded, it seems a stochastic niche model could do just as well. So one of the key things that's been done is to just show that neutral theory provides a good fit to species abundance distributions in tropical forests and in other systems. Uh, but what happens there is people uh, do these fits, leaving the parameters theta and m free. And uh, so that essentially, it's easy to argue that if you had a stochastic niche model, you could probably get just as good of a fit with that kind of parameter freedom. Uh, the other uh, issue is that when neutral theory has failed, it's typically easy to argue that it's due to the neutral model that's being used, ignoring demographic complexity that has little to do with niches, rather than because the niches are actually at play. So for example, for these species abundance distribution fits, even if we had managed to reject neutral theory, uh, it could be easy to argue uh, that the rejections had more to do with the neutral model being really simple and maybe not having factored in things like uh, how size structure might influence demography or uh, how uh, community size fluctuations in the past might have influenced species abundances. Okay, so there's also been a lot of other kinds of tests of neutral theory, not just on species abundance distributions, but often it's easy to make these arguments that uh, in particular demographic complexity could be at play uh, for departures from neutral theory. So uh, why is there this challenge, especially in contrast to the evolutionary biology context? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm kind of borrowing that term from the population genetics context, and I might not mean exactly the same thing that they do there. But um, what I mean it to be are things like uh, how birth and death rates could depend on the size of an individual, or how the size of a community might have varied in the past, or the details of dispersal limitation, uh, so they're not p picked up all that well necessarily in a spatially implicit model. So basically just kind of the model details that don't have to do with niches kind of could encompass a lot of things, speciation mechanisms, things like that. So uh, in the evolutionary biology context, the way that people uh, deal with demographic complexity is basically to use calibration on a large number of genes or comparison across similar species. So uh, they might take a, a section of the genome and make some more complicated neutral model and decide what the parameters of that neutral model should be by fitting it to that section of the genome, sort of presuming that it's dominated by neutral loci. And then they look for the signature of selection at a particular loci, so departures from that neutral model. So they have a way of calibrating their model. Um, another approach is there's various kinds of statistics that are designed for comparing across similar species uh, that I won't go into in part because I'm not an expert on them. But it's harder to come up with these approaches basically in the ecological context. Uh, you can imagine we don't really have like a whole genome, we just have one community. Uh, maybe we could try to find some other similar communities to compare to. Uh, but so far that hasn't really been done. So how can we overcome uh, problems with tests of neutral theory? Well, that's some, one thing that we've been trying to work towards uh, in my lab, my students and postdocs and I. And uh, some of the kinds of things we're doing are first to figure out what differences in community structure are produced by niches by studying stochastic niche models. So models that include the stochasticity in neutral theory, but also a niche mechanism. And uh, just to show one pretty movie of the kind of thing I mean, one thing we've done is to study a stochastic version of the Locke volterra competition model on a trade axis. Uh, so when you make competition independent of the distance between species, you don't get any kind of patterning. Uh, but when you have it depend on the dif distance between species, these niches actually emerge on the axis. And uh, interestingly, you get this kind of clumped pattern. So these species that are dominant are the ones that would be uh, at the limits of similarity. They could stably coexist with one another. And the other ones around are basically persisting through mass effects. So uh, immigration uh, allows them to persist even though they would be competitively excluded in the long time scale. And interestingly, the ones that are close to the ones at the limits of similarity uh, do better than being right between. So when niche space is full, it's actually better to be closer to a species that's at the limits to similarity. So these niches emerge on the trade axes and species are clustered rather than uh, dispersed. So often people look for uh, uh, dispersion patterns on trade axes as evidence of niches and it seems that we get something different than that 
Um, and uh, we also look at the impacts on species abundance distributions, and in this model find a bigger impact than uh, some of the other approaches that have been out there using simpler stochastic niche models. Uh, another kind of thing we're doing is to figure out uh, what demographic complexity is important to neutral model predictions. So we've been looking at things like size, structure, demographic rates, um, fat tail dispersal, so where long distance events are uh, more uh, uh, prevalent than uh, a lot of models typically tend to um, represent them as. Uh, and uh, so basically trying to figure out for which predictions of neutral theory, what kind of demographic complexity do you have to include. And the last is to figure out how to construct tests of neutral theory so that we can ignore more of the demographic complexity. So is there some way we can shape the context so that we don't have to deal with as much demographic complexity and also where we might focus better on the particular differences that niches actually create. And uh, along the lines of the last one, one thing that we've been focusing on is that um, uh, to make use of data on species abundances at a regional scale. So instead of using uh, the neutral model at the meta community scale that involves this really simple speciation mechanism that nobody really believes is to um, actually have data on species abundances and ask the question of whether species abundances in a local community are uh, different than what you'd expect based on dispersal from a regional pool given their abundance. And this kind of approach is already actually starting to be used in um, uh, microbiome research, so there's uh, another a postdoc at Michigan uh, in somebody else's lab that's been looking at, for example, whether the lung microbiome is different than you'd expect based on dispersal from the mouth uh, using a comparison with neutral theory. Uh, and we've been applying this to BCI where there is some data on species abundances at a regional scale and finding actually a pretty strong signature of selection, but it's using a very simple model at this point. <coughs> So I just want to finish up with some words about um, uh, this idea of a connection between neutral theory and more entropy-based approaches. Um, really, I just wanted to point out a couple of papers that, I've, that I find interesting. So just putting up John Hart's here, just to highlight, uh, in case people didn't notice it, that uh, the maximum entropy prediction for the species abundance distribution is, a, is this log series distribution that you get um, in the non-interactive case of neutral theory, at least. Um, and, but interestingly there, you have to um, pr pick a particular um, distribution to start with. So John talked about this uh, allocating individuals to species and metabolic requirements to different individuals. So that's the object that you have to think about to actually get the same uh, prediction that's in neutral theory. So an interesting question is, is why is that? Does that somehow incorporate neutral dynamics um, or not? Uh, another paper that I saw recently uh, it's by Bowler, uh, and it's looking at uh, how to get the same species abundance distribution that neutral theory predicts, so this log series distribution. Um, and there it takes the approach of asking what the priors have to be in order to get that distribution. And um, comes up with that they actually have to be 1 over n, so there's some like inherent uh, probability that's proportional to 1 over n of a species having abundance n. And I think this is interesting, but at the same time, I'm not as sure uh, what to make of it. I don't know how to interpret the prior. Uh, and that might be in part uh, because I come from like a st statistical physics perspective. And I, at least when I took the class, I don't really remember this idea of priors in it. So I don't even know what, what to make of it exactly. But it, it's interesting to me. And then uh, this other paper that was actually put online by Michael Gilchrist. And I had seen it before, but I forgot about it. So it was. Nice to see it up there. And um, this is making more a connection with um, neutral theory in the evolutionary biology context, and not just neutral theory, really, a theory that can have uh, deleterious mutations as well as ad advantageous mutations. And uh, there, the distribution that's focused on, it's not this, the analogy to a species abundance distribution. It's actually more the probability for a given allele to be fixed in the population, like how much time does it spend being fixed in the population. And they actually do show this nice analogy with statistical physics uh, where uh, the uh, analogy to the energy is the, the fitness associated with the allele and they can define a, a temperature. Um, but uh, one thing I've been going back through my statistical physics textbooks and the way I've seen um, the Boltzmann distribution derived is actually through this thinking about um, uh, uh, contact with an infinite reservoir. And that's one 
piece of it that I can't really see in this paper. So this idea of um, deriving the Boltzmann distribution for a system by thinking about uh, thermal contact with a reservoir. Um, and so anyway, that's something that interests me to try to uh, think about it more from that perspective. Um, so I'll just leave you with those ideas and uh, hopefully stimulate some discussion about what the relationship is between neutral theory and entropy approaches.